Well, hello, and thank you so much for tuning in. My name's Josh with Josh Likens Visuals, and today I'm here with my friend Elizabeth Slagle, and she's the owner of Weymouth Hill Event Venue, which is where we're filming today. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh, thanks for having me or coming out to see us. Yes, I'm really excited because today we're gonna to be talking all about wedding venues, how to find them, how to book them, what things to look for in them. Um, but before we do that, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. So we're what you would call a boutique wedding venue and we're located just outside of Ironton, Ohio on a wooded hilltop. And it's a beautiful venue. If you haven't been here yet or haven't seen it, then you should definitely go check out waymouthhill.com. So let's talk a little bit about the process of like finding and booking a venue. So say that you're a bride and or groom um, and you're looking for a venue, what are some of like the main things to look for in a venue? I, I like to put venue, wedding venues in three categories. I like to say um, you have venue only, you have semi-inclusive, and you have an all-inclusive venue. So a lot of people just have to decide when they're looking. I think that's where the big confusion lies is because all venues are a little different and their offerings are a little different. So venue only would be someone who just, you know, they have a lot of help or they want to keep maybe more budget minded and they don't need all of the extras. Semi-inclusive would also are the ones that will give you more latitude, which is what we are. We're here to help you pull off your perfect wedding day, but we give you the latitude to bring in who you like vendor wise and what you want to do. Um, and all inclusive, those are great too. Those are great for the people that are really busy. And those are just where it's pretty much you have a package and you come in and you just show up with your dress and you're, you're ready to go. So, so I like to put them in three different categories and I think that's something to keep in mind with time-wise and what your budget is, what, what, what is important to you. You said that you're kind of in the semi-inclusive category. Yes. What are some of like the things that you guys offer like as add-ons? So semi-inclusive means um, we provide you with this beautiful space but what we've noticed is a lot of people only do a wedding or they plan a wedding once in their life. So it's not something you do every day, but we see weddings every weekend. So we like to step in and help out as far as helping you with your timeline, making sure that you haven't forgotten an item, or we also help you with layout plans. And then we do all, we have our day of coordinator that day. That's someone that's just here to make sure that your day is flowing, your vendors are arriving, and that your day will go as planned. So she will follow your schedule, she cues everyone for your ceremony, and um, as far as add-ons, we've been adding, <laughs> adding decor, we've been adding tents, we've been adding candle packages, so we have a lot of things that we do offer as far as full dinnerware, um, we have some fun uh, vintage ice cream cart, and our new thing this year is the moke. So if you don't know what a moke is, it's a really fun getaway electric. It's a cross between a, a, a golf cart and a Jeep. Oh, that's fun. So, yeah, lots of fun. With the day of coordinator, um, would you recommend for most folks to get that? Or is there situations where you think maybe you don't need one or it's more beneficial to have one? So in our packages, we include the day of coordinator. Um, but as you are looking at other venues, that is something that is usually an add-on or it is something that um, they don't offer. I do highly recommend a day of coordinator unless you have a wedding planner, someone, and we work really well with wedding planners as well, someone that's kind of helping you from start to finish and then they can take that role on that day as well. But most people, yes, I think they do need a day of coordinator. Does the day of coordinator work usually only on the day or are they working with the couple any prior to the wedding? Sure, it's a great question. So there's different options for that. So our day of coordinator, she is also a certified wedding planner. So if you want to hire on her services more extensively than what we offer, you are free to do that. She can hire your vendors for you. So she can do everything if that's what you need. But for us and most of our clients, they like to do a lot of that on their own or they have the time or their mother likes to be involved. So for us, she is the day of coordinator. So I say a day of coordinator, but we also meet with our clients 45 days before their wedding. And this is a long, lengthy meeting where we sit down and we go over a timeline, a seating chart, and how the day will flow. So we have a list of all their vendors and their wedding party. And so we're mapping, we're put, creating that roadmap for how that day will go, even before the day is here. 
So um, it's really nice. So we call all of our clients vendors the week of just to touch base to make sure they've been to our venue before, like you. you we've talked on the phone quite a bit. Uh -huh. So we always get your ETA and we make a very detailed list on our end. So that way the bride, the bride's family, they don't have to stress over all of those details. Like they don't have to know that the DJ might be a little bit late or that the cake hasn't arrived. We're on the phone taking care of that, making sure that those vendors are here and in place and that they can just enjoy the day and be present in their wedding day. And that takes a pretty big weight off of the couple's shoulders because I know Absolutely. that planning a wedding is quite a lot. There's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of logistics. Yes. So it definitely makes a big difference for you guys to help with a lot of that. Right, we try to, we try to be very helpful on that day. So let's talk a little bit about timelines where we were mentioning that a little bit before where the coordinator and you guys are working with making sure that all the um, vendors are where they need to be, touching base with them. So how does putting a timeline together usually look? What are you usually, what's your starting point for a timeline? Well, a timeline is very important. So yes, the starting point is usually what time does the couple want to get married? And then we back away from that and then we go behind that. So if they want a 5.30 ceremony, then we look at arrival times and prep times. And so, and then we fit in first look, not a first look, or how many is in their wedding party? Because, you know, there is a lot to be, you know, your numbers make a difference. And if it's a small wedding party, it's not as, you know, complicated. But if you're, if you have eight or to 10 bridesmaids, that's a lot of time for hair and makeup that you need to account for. So we like to try to gauge that. And we also, that's why we're asking who their wedding, you know, who is doing their hair and makeup. And on occasion, we will see that where we have one hairdresser trying to do more than five bridesmaids hair. And we usually recommend if you have five bridesmaids to go up an extra hairdresser or makeup artist. Or maybe add purposes. on more time if you can. Yes, yes. And you know, it's just, it's always great if the couple can keep in mind that there are gonna be little blips in the road and it's not the end of the world. Um, you know, there's things that get forgotten, which we try to keep a really good supply of things here. That way someone doesn't have to run home or out to, to grab something. So we keep our emergency stashes of items that you should or would could need on your wedding day. And as far as the timeline on the back end, we always say the reception, we can time it out. We can kind of come up with some ideas of what a timeline would look like. But that's where, again, a day of coordinator is really good because she's great at reading the room and watching what your guests are doing and, and just making sure that you have a great guest experience in that if photos are taking too long, your guests are getting antsy, she might go and nudge the photographer or she might step up or, you know, we may change the lineup of items within the reception. So again, another plug for why a day of coordinator can be just the game changer because it's always nice to have someone that's standing back watching your guests, making sure that things are flowing as they should. Yeah, because timelines never go exactly to plan. They're always off a little bit on one way or another, shorter or, fast, or, shorter or longer. Right. Um, so it's not, it's not the end of the world if it goes a little bit over in one portion or another. Absolutely. It's normal. It's normal for that to happen. Yes, yes. So in terms of um, guest count, where we were talking a little bit about um, how many are in your wedding party, what about like total guest count? What are some things to consider whenever you're making your guest list? Whether you're having planning on having like a smaller wedding with maybe less than 50 or 100 people okay. or more than that, what are some things to consider? Well, first of all is money, <laughs> your budget. Um, I feel like I always tell people when they're looking to cut budget, they might look at cutting services or different things, but honestly, the best way to cut your budget is your guest count because you're basically paying per person for your food and beverage for every guest that is here. Um, and I will say for 2024, we are definitely seeing those guest counts are shrinking. Um, we're seeing a lot of people opt for the more intimate weddings. And I honestly can say no regrets. A lot of people feel like 
the more intimate weddings are more in line with what they want and they are present and they get to be with or engage with at least most of their guests while they're here. Whereas if they have a huge guest count, they don't get to engage with everyone as well. Nothing against great big weddings. Uh, I just feel like that's a trend that we are definitely seeing here is people are going into more intentional, smaller guest counts and um, keeping, yeah, and keeping definitely that's a factor when you're looking at your ven venue is, you know, you have to have an idea of does mom have this huge family? You know, does dad have to invite all of his partners in the law firm or, you know, so you, you look at that as well um, when you're, you know, so you definitely want to tour venues that are in that wheelhouse and can accommodate your size. Yeah, because I know that it's tough to cut down guest lists because yeah. you have family and friends and cousins and everybody and it can be difficult to make the decision of like who is coming, who's not. So I heard something that people are doing more is having like a smaller day of wedding and then having a reception afterwards yes. where you invite more people. You can invite two, three hundred people, yes. everybody that you wanted to there. Um, so that's always an option too. The trends are changing so much that I feel like I, I, I'm, I welcome them here, you know, just because we have three packages doesn't mean that's the, all that we would do. We are always open to those suggestions like, hey, have you ever thought about letting us do this on a Friday night and then having a Sunday brunch? Absolutely. The sky's the limit. Yeah. So, I, you know, it's your wedding. It should be what you want. Because how many can you guys accommodate? So here we like to say 150 is our sweet spot, but uh, we can go up to 180. Because you guys just got a new tent this yes. year, an outdoor tent. So I think that is a good topic to talk about is weather. Weather. <laughs> <laughs> weather can be very unpredictable, as we all know, yes. um, especially if you're doing your wedding outside at any point, um, which a lot of people do, and it's always awesome outside. Um, right. But sometimes, well, that bug scared me. <laughs> but sometimes uh, the weather can be unpredictable. Like we said, it can rain, it can be windy. Um, so what are some suggestions for people to plan ahead, like a backup plan, just in case the weather's not right, great? Right, absolutely. And every now and then we'll see someone that's completely risk adverse and they won't want to fill with an outdoor wedding. But a lot of people opt for certain months because they feel like those are the more pleasant weather months and then they snub the August or the Julys. Mm -hmm. Because uh, they don't want the heat, which is also, you know, you you know yourself. If you don't like the heat, don't do a summer wedding. Yeah. But I will say, just in and maybe you've seen this as well, you can have ninety degree days in May, and you can have seventy degree days in December. Mm -hmm. So, so you just again, weather is so unpredictable. But yes, we did get a tent for a rain option. Uh, that kind of takes a little bit of that that factor out of it. But we're also really good with rain delays here. Um, we have negotiated a couple of uh, ceremonies that were about to start right as uh, the rain was coming in. And we always just, we come, we're good at pivoting. Again, another reason why a day of coordinator is also good to have. And we also keep on our phones, you know, the, the radar and we're watching the radar very carefully to make sure that we're hitting the window just right. And you have indoor spaces too, just yes. in case the weather gets too bad. Like we have the cabin that we're in right now, you have the cottage. Yes. So it's nice to have places to go just in case the weather does get too bad. Absolutely, yes, but weather is just so unpredictable. You can't, it's just a, something you have to be willing to deal with and it, just make sure that your venue has a good rain plan and that they have the ability to pivot and work along with that. So let's talk a little bit about pricing, um, venue pricing. I know that that is kind of a broad subject and it's very subject to change and depends on the venue. Um, so what are maybe like some aspects to consider whenever you're looking at venue pricing? So I think as a couple, what you need to do is sit down and decide what is the most important to you um, when you're getting married. Is it your guest experience? Is it where you get married? Is it your your photographs that you're left with? So you kind of, pro every couple will do that. They prioritize what's the most important to them. I do feel like your venue is, is up there in your importance because uh, your location, is it private? Is it uh, easy to get to? Um, do your guests have to travel a long ways? Um, 
is a, you know, are there places, lodging and places for my out-of-town guests to stay? So there is so much to consider in your venue, but as far as pricing, you definitely have to look at overall what is most important to you. So when people are doing their search for venues, how, what's like a good number that they should tour? So I think it's, it's nice when you make a list of venues that are in the location you want, can house as many guests as you're expecting, are in your budget. And the next thing to look for that not everyone does is to what, what fits your style. But I do think that you have to see it. It's like buying a house. You know, you have to go in and physically see that house before you buy it. And I think you can you get a good feel when you're here at our venue, if this venue fits your vibe. If this is not what you're looking for or you had something else in mind, you know, we we, know, we always say our feelings are never hurt because we understand that you had more of an urban feeling in your Pinterest mood board or you wanted something more industrial. That's obviously not our venue. But um, yeah, I would say one to two or three is a good number to tour. A good kind of gauge whenever you're touring the venues is, do you like the venue owner, whoever is touring you around? Do you like their personality? Are they very helpful? Um, do you like the amenities that they provide? Do you think that they have a good overall aesthetic? Do you like the setting? Um, is it convenient? I think a lot of what you're paying for a lot of times is convenience. We're going back to the um, kind of three categories of venues, full service or part service. Um, a lot of that is convenience on your part. How much are you doing versus how much is the venue doing for you? Another thing to consider too, and, and we see this on occasion, is if you have someone in your uh, wedding party or someone close to you that's a handicap access, needs a handicap accessibility, that's another thing to look for in venues. Um, I'm proud to say we're all ADA compliant here, but we and we definitely try to make that work. So if someone is just beginning their search, say you just got engaged, you're just starting to look for your different vendors, and you're looking for a venue, what are like some of the first things to consider? Well, most people go to a Google search first to say what venues are in my area. And then the next step would be to look at your budget and your guest count and location. Like you said, do you want to stay local? Do you want to go out of state? Are you fine with going to maybe a venue that fits your vibe a little better, but it might be a 45 minute to an hour drive for you and your guest? Um, those are the things to consider when you're first starting out. I think that we have covered quite a lot of stuff in this video. Hopefully, Hopefully you guys found this uh, helpful and educational. Um, and yeah, Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming. Well, thanks. Thank you so much, Josh. Always a pleasure. Yeah, always good to see you too.